Good afternoon, everybody. Where's his Hello. Oh, yeah. Welcome to this session. Uh, we have a really nice setting in what is pretty much the nicest room of the building. Brand new, uh, a lot of light coming in, so it's a good start. Um, I'm very excited to interact with you for about an hour and a half on a subject that is very dear to me, very important to me, um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, you see my, uh, my affiliation here. I'm a associate professor in organizational theory uh, here at RSM. And I'm also the academic director of our full-time MBA program uh, since September. Do we have any MBA grants? From the... Yeah, there we go. Good. Yeah, keen to interact more with you, if you want order. Keen to interact with anybody, but keen to specifically learn a little bit more about uh, how your experience was and what we can take uh, with us from there. Um, but um, my personal journey increasingly has been going in this direction of trying to understand what we often call the softer sides of organization, which are actually the harder sides to get right. And increasingly so, we live in a society and in a world where with digitalization and automation, paradoxically, I think, potentially, the role of people actually becomes more and more important, right? Really understanding the value of human touch uh, becomes, becomes crucially important for organizations to be successful. Right? So I've moved a little bit in this direction. Um, you know, I, I was I was more of a sort of hard, hard science mindset always. Um, so I came to that also, uh, uh, brought that with me to, to, to university when I did my PhD. And over time, I transformed. I transformed from being really about, you know, the numbers and the statistics to figuring out, well, these are the things that are really important, but they're so difficult to grasp, right? So um, in my research, I focus on this stuff. Um, one of the things I'm working on is to try to make sense of that human touch, human value in an organization through the notion that I like to use of craft, right? Comparing the role of a human in an organization to that of a, a craftsperson. Um, I build that insight from a long study that I did in the beer brewing industry, where we've seen that notion of craft coming back quite strongly. And so I'm extending these observations now also in other sectors. Uh, but for me, at the end of the day, a lot of these things come back to how we think about culture inside our organizations and outside our organizations. It's one of the most powerful things that we can do, especially when we're in a leading position. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but what I mostly also want to do is give you an opportunity um, to work a little bit with the subject and learn from each other. Right? There's a unique opportunity here that we're creating interactions and insights into what other companies are working on or struggling with, and that we bring that uh, out um, so that we can all learn from that. Um, so I'll structure a few exercises. I'll leave you also with some frameworks that I find very useful. Um, but the warning is already that as soon as we start breaking this down and make it seem uh, mechanical through framework, right? there's also a risk. Right? At the end of the day, a lot of it has to happen a little bit more through your authentic uh, behavior rather than through mechanical application of a framework. So when we arrive to a framework, for me, it's really a source of inspiration and it allows you, it forces you to reflect on how you act and interact. But my point is not here to really break it down like an engineering process, right? So that's a difficult thing we need to do. We're, we're struggling with a subject that is inherently difficult to grasp. Right? Now I'm very interested to hear a little bit about your interest and motivation. Uh, what brought you to this session? Or right? and or what what are you hoping to get out of this session? What are some of the questions that are on your minds that we might get to? I'd okay. like to go there first. Yeah, I'll start. Thank you. Uh, Maybe very briefly, we were what, what the program you graduated from? A small group, so that I helps. Studied the master finance and investment graduated nice. four years ago, and I work as an FBNA controller at the Medic Medical Company, and. Uh, our role is also to influence the business leaders to make more profitable uh, decisions. Uh, so therefore, I thought, oh, this, this part makes sense uh, to go to. More profitable decisions. Yeah, good. <laughs> I am Sam. I graduated two years ago from the management of innovation and master here. Nice. And I work now as a business engineer at a uh, consultant and product company. But also there, I'm involved in an ESG team. Yep. that we formed uh, bottom up and with that team we try to influence the well top uh, management to also give it mandate to do something or to nice. do vision on esg and that is a different uh, clearly 
Right. Massive cultural challenge for many organizations, right? So I think we here already have a really nice spectrum of the kinds of cultural challenges that all the organizations are facing here in the room, probably. Any other thoughts, any other specific questions maybe around culture? Yeah. Yeah. This table is very productive. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a freelance consultant, nice. but at some point I would like to develop to a bigger company with multiple people. And I would like to know uh, what I could do to get the culture right or positive from the from the start yeah. difficult one i think we will end up with a good i think example of a company that i think that did a pretty good job that for me in any case has been a source of inspiration so hopefully that will resonate with you yeah my name is Pim Rosdunk. Uh, i work in a company that makes bakery equipment and since the war in ukraine uh, our clientele is diminishing so we're supplying to bigger food companies at the moment yeah. that's a unilever but we still have a mindset supplying to small Company, so the culture has to change, become more professional to supply to these bigger OEMs. Yeah, very good. If I, if I want to also add something that I often see, right, uh, it's a cultural challenge because you want to scale and grow, right, and you want to add something, but there's also a risk that you lose something, yeah. right? So it's a difficult challenge when you scale up uh, and professionalize. Um, so I'm Katie, I'm from MBA 21, and uh, I'm currently a finance manager at Amazon. My interest in this topic is basically the company is really so big. We do have an overarching dominant culture. I think it's very strong across the company. Mm. But I want to see there's lots of culture across you know, yeah. different teams, even with finance themselves. Yeah. And I'm really interested in you know how we impact in such a big company. Yeah. Team. Yeah. 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 Very very good points. And clearly, it's you know especially in a large company, it's beyond the control of any leader, right? And then culture very quickly, it, it becomes about all the little things uh, that we do. Um, so culture, as I'll say at some point, is a thousand things a thousand times, right? Um, and that's one way to think about it, right? That is one way that you can orchestrate even a cultural effect in a very large company by making it you know, smaller and actually manageable for anybody. And then naturally, I think there is always an opportunity for you to shape the culture within your team, right? Um, no culture should be a straitjacket. Right. And at any level, you have an opportunity to, to make small cultural improvements. Right. So the things I would like to do are flexible enough that they can be applied, hopefully, at, at different layers. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Max. Uh, I graduated from the Strategic Entrepreneurship uh, program, uh, program last year. Um, and last year, we also started a uh, startup in the music industry with a team of three. And as the team is slowly uh, expanding now, um, I thought this might be the perfect time to Get more knowledge about how to build up a company culture that uh, will last forever. Great. I think you're right. That's the right time. There's many startups that have that, that forgot about this important point, and then their culture turned out into something that they didn't really like, and then they struggled, right, to put the genie back in the bottle. So thinking about it from day one, even when you're really small, and you think, well, you know, we all know how we work, right? It's still very important to, to think about how can we embed it, can we institutionalize it so that it outlasts potentially even us as a founding team. It's really important. Great. I'm sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. One more. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Peggy. I graduated from Master in Management of 2016. Now I work in HR uh, in Justin Tiffany. And one of my key area of focus will be diversity and inclusion. So yes. that is very much with the culture. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, I think my key takeaway I wanted to have today would be um, how do you... No, I like this. This is precisely why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, how do you uh, create a psychological safe environment so that people shine authentically themselves yeah. without feeling the need to fit in? Okay. Because feeling is the opposite of feeling belong. So yeah. That's kind of my... Uh, okay. I think I'm lucky. I think I have a case that resonates with this because, you know, Fair point to all these questions. We could have a separate focus set focus session. We really focus key takeaways, but I think I can connect to all these themes. And luckily, also substantively, I think we can connect to this theme, which I think is indeed also one of the themes that many organizations are, are grappling with, specifically, including us actually here and how we do that in the MBA properly, for instance. Um, good. Um, I know some of you are going to watch this online. So for those of you that are in the room, if you're in the middle, uh, you may be on camera. And it's only for people that uh, watch the recording later. Yeah, just so you know. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can move further out. Um, 
But uh, for those of you that are uh, watching this back, there's gonna be some exercises that you will have to do on your own and that we're gonna do in a room here. So I hope you don't mind. Um, good. What I'd like to do now is first take a really big step back to really um, build a really fundamental insight that has really changed the way I look at how organizations function from this perspective. And that ultimately is something that continues to inspire us when we move through a more specific problems. And it's really going back far in time. It's really thinking about the origin or the evolution of the human species, right? So if you go big really far in time, uh, interestingly enough, there used to be um, many different species on the planet. Uh, the Homo sapiens was initially quite a marginalized species. Um, had to be afraid of pretty much everything in the environment. There were other Homo species, actually, human species that we competed with, Neanderthals, for instance, right? But something happened that started to set us apart, right? And that made us now, in any case, by our own definitions, we look at larger species, right? The most dominant species on the planet. Right? There's no other species that has that much control over the environment as, as do we, as far as we know. My main question here is, what is it that set us apart from other species and even other species of human? They drove out of existence. Right? Was it our tool making skills? Was it our raw intelligence? Was it our collective imagination? Or was it yet something else? I think, uh, we can, I, interested to have a quick poll, just, just so we have the, the room. So you can go to Menti briefly. No, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> You can you can scan the QR or you can go to menti.com. And then I believe it takes me to the next question. It's not working. All right. Try it again. Get into Airbnb question. Yeah, try it. Try it again. Uh, okay. Ah, yeah. Sorry, the code is there's a typo. That's my mistake. That's um that's a bad one. The code is A218, so there's a two missing. Can we do the 5451A218? The scan, does that work? Yeah. yeah. Scan should work. So, yeah. Eight, two, one, eight. yeah. I'm getting responses, so if something is working. 5451A218. Yeah. I have nine responses, 10. Yeah. Giving you a little bit more time. Yeah, it's working. If you, yeah, you can have the same. Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's, let's work. Seventeen. But he's still trying to respond. Yeah, we have a few more, right? All right, let's have a look. Rights is one of the very important Yeah. So, what do you think? What is the response going to look like here, Janet? What do you think? How are people responding here? I think mostly C. Mostly C. Connected imagination and a little bit other. A little bit other? Okay. Do you agree here? Yes. Hmm? Um, nice. Pretty, pretty clear answer. Well done. Who, who voted tool making skills though? That's the interesting. Me. Yeah, why? Yeah, I don't think you could have found out. I mean, that the tool making skills is more objective. You can actually find out from archaeology that you could they grew because you found more tools and sites yeah. where there were yeah, yeah. Homo sapiens. But I don't think you can measure collective imagination of a species that didn't exist. Right. It's right. also so what, what kind of what, you, what, what, what kind of evidence you can actually yeah. find for this, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What how do you know that in Neanderthals didn't have collective imagination? You know. Fair enough. Anybody wants to defend the raw intelligence, which is also an answer that's voted for? Raw intelligence. Oh, the dolphins. Well, the dolphins, are really huh? <laughs> dolphins are also really smart. Dolphins are also very smart. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's go to collective imagination. Why collective imagination? Because you have to have a vision to prosper. So you have to have a general, ungraspable uh, thing you're striving for, and then 
make it a realization. You can only realize something when you have a general idea with each other. With okay. Do. And why did that set us apart from other species? Because it creates alignment. Creates alignment. Interesting. Yeah. Anything? Any other reasons? That way we can work together with thousands or ten thousands of people. That's right. Yeah. What about other? What should go in there? Uh, social learning. I think you need both of these things. Basically, right. you need to work together to a goal. But if everyone has to think of everything itself, has to invent everything by itself, like me and Dallas before did with high law intelligence, you have yeah. to start at zero every time. And that we don't do. Yeah, right. So it's a way we cooperate, right? The social learning in that process. That's something that you had as well. Or you had another point. Uh, mine was more about, well, it's been a while, but I think the biological difference between the endothelium and the homo sapiens was also the formation of the throat. I'm not sure. But oh, I like, I like that we're going into specific biology. So, so I think that maybe we were able to phrase more sounds, which would ah. communicate more about about these things, which I think is the, the foundation of all of these things. Ah. So then you can I like that. say that it is only collective imagination because I think uh, agriculture also played a big role because else you would still be. Yes. Hunting, and then you would still yeah. consider to, be right. to some degree when you really go into this, you could, you could construct a chicken or egg kind of story because one supports the other. Uh, but but I like the way you're thinking here, and it's something that uh, uh, is actually also what I was gonna put up here as as an answer that I think is increasingly being recognized. Let me see, uh, maybe some of you have read this book. That's where actually this comes from. Right, so it's 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 looking at the history of humankind uh, based on the archaeological record that we have and our best theories that are never perfect. Right, we can never fully prove them. Uh, interestingly, actually, there's currently also um, a kids' version of this book. I'm reading it to my ten-year-old son. It's actually even better than this book. I recommend reading it because I now understand the book better because I'm reading it to my son. Um, but but what it uh, what Harari really convincingly argued that at some point something uh, remarkable happened to us as a species that indeed allowed us to uh, communicate about things that didn't necessarily exist right in front of us right so we have other species that are very intelligent they can communicate in quite complex ways but they only communicate about things that are right there right there right so oh there is a lion uh, behind a tree we better hide and protect ourselves or something like that. those communication structures we've seen in other animal on uh, other species right but for some reason humans developed the possibility to imagine things that were really there and then use that imagination to indeed create collaboration at in unprecedented numbers right and there's one more element right so we know other species can collaborate extremely well you look at think of ants for instance their collaboration structures are in some ways, right, even more impressive than what humans do. However, what is unique to human collaboration is that we're really flexible. We can change. We can find any configuration that works that allows us to, out of a sudden, align indeed, align with strangers, right? And that is because we we have this power that we, as far as we know, no other species really has. So for me, it's quite fundamental because when you start thinking about that that is really changing the way you potentially look at the world, right? So from this perspective, what an organization is, right? It's in principle something that we've collectively imagined. Right? So in this book, Harari draws the parallel with Peugeot. Peugeot happens to have a logo that resembles the first piece of art that has been found in the archeological record, the Leeuwenmensch, which people interpret, they don't know, but they think this was the first time that People had a story about a god or a spirit, and someone made a statue out of it. Let's keep coming back in Peugeot, but in principle, it doesn't objectively exist. <laughs> and that's an odd thing to realize. Peugeot is a fiction, right? It's something that we formalize through papers and rituals, right? Um, there are people that work for Peugeot that are very real, they're buildings, right? But we can change all those things, and Peugeot continues to exist. Similarly, Peugeot can disappear and all those physical things still, are still there, right? So to think about this, right, that the world is really socially constructed through our collective imagination is an important starting point. Any thoughts, questions on that? For me, this is quite radical when I went through this, right? I started to look at the world slightly differently and a little bit uh, uncomfortable in some ways, right? But for me, the main thing to take away from this then 
is that culture is not necessarily just a thing, right, that you create or manage. For me, it's really a lens. It's basically everything we do inside and around organizations, we can see through this lens. Right? We can start looking at our work, our organizations, our position in the world slightly differently when we start putting it in this, in this perspective. Right? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. And, and, you know, very happy also to get critical questions because it helps us move forward, right? So starting from a point where you say we can collectively imagine something, mm -hmm. how would you say there is a generic, universal, human, ethical side on imagining something? Because the question was asked about a safe work environment, but it depends on what the people are imagining together that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not saying that there is one way in which we do that, right? Oh, but and, 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 and while this is our biggest power, it's also our biggest weakness, right? Because as soon as we imagine different structures and start to firmly believe in them, right? They can be um, forcing us in massive clashes over things that are in principle, right? Fictional to some degree, right? And I'm not saying necessarily this is really about religion because religion is a clear example. But even science, at the end of the day, starts with our collective imagination, right? It's about things that we cannot directly observe, right? We imagine something is happening, we form hypotheses, we try and test them, yeah. right? And even there, you get the same kind of clashes because you have different paradigms that work around different imaginations, ultimately. But let me, let me put in the question Go ahead. a little bit. Yeah. So the question really is, how do you protect the individual in the collective imagination? Because if you want to have an inclusive environment or an inclusive culture, yeah. you're basically saying we have a collective set of wishes and needs, yeah. but we respect every single one that deviates from this collective culture. So basically, you're throwing away the whole culture. I like this. Any thoughts from the room? I think you got a good point. Uh, because a lot of research has been done by some Dutch guys, Hofstede and Trompenaars. Yeah, company culture. Sure, yeah, could have a whole session on Hofstede. But they basically, exactly what he says is uh, the problem is people come from different backgrounds, yeah. different cultures, and you know how if you want to have successful company culture, how do you mix those? Because in yeah. certain cultures, you know, uh, hierarchy is something very yeah. different than in, in the Dutch culture, so to say. Yeah, yeah, right, uh, Hofstede. Make, yeah, you, go ahead. you can also make a distinction between uh, respect some differences and and you know implement those differences so you know somebody may choose to think differently and say yes that's good you have a view and then okay fine but then this i have one view and this other person has another view and that's okay yeah but you know you don't have to necessarily immediately implement everything that you see so what do you mean can, can you make it a little bit more concrete do you have an example of what you're talking about here? let's say you know there are three people who say this often happens all the time maybe even even in finance departments right yeah. so i'm a finance guy so <laughs> there are people who come from different companies who have worked in a certain way and then they come and you come into a new company and things are already running in a certain way and they say no 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 you know what i did this in this company and i wanted to be like this as well mm -hmm. you say yes that's good <laughs> people right but you know let's uh let's first uh, try and uh, find where there are some alignment uh and once you know we have something that truly works here, then and then alone would we try and implement something yeah. brand new. So we just say it's about compromising that agreement. Culture is some degree in agreements. Yeah. And culture. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So maybe not formally, but uh, informally, it's an it's an agreement. So we'll how make, to, we'll how agreement that because makes the agreements. Yeah. 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 Very key because that's that goes against inclusivity. Yeah. yeah. We, we can get to that, right? And specifically, it's, it's, it's interesting because you could put another layer, right? Our cultural uh, essence or, or ambition could be we want an inclusive culture. And that means actually that we have individuals that can deviate, right? But how does that still add up to a whole becomes complex, right? So you, at the end of the day, there's a balancing act where we need, and I'm going to use the word essence, I cannot really find anything else, but what is the essence of our organization? What we all sort of agree on and can align on and agree on what we're trying to do, right? And then around that, there should be room for people to be themselves outside of what technically matters for work, right? How we do things in an inclusive way, to be heard, to be seen, to be able to contribute, right? But oftentimes, there's still going to be a little bit of a clash, right? You bring something indeed from a different sector in, Right, and that's our first place, right? If we want to protect that essence of who we are, what we want to do, the first place to shape that is in social selection, right? So when people come into the door, 
Um, what do we observe? Do they fit? Right? And that we can only do that if we have some idea of what it is that we're looking for. Right? When we're small and you're a founding team, you maybe find that naturally, but when you grow, this thing get, can get lost, right? So then we need to have a discussion of this and how do we protect that. Uh, the second thing where you can influence is, is in, the, is, is in the, is social influence, we call that, right? So social selection, who comes in? And social influence is what is the context that we provide, right? So how do we uh, structure the organization? How do we run our teams? How do we do our trainings, right? Rules and regulations. Hmm? Rules and regulations within the company. I like this because usually we would say culture is about all the informal stuff. My point is no, culture is everything, yeah. right? So if you do not include that in your, or how you reward people, then you're not going to be able to shape the culture, right? Because then you're going to get uh, opposite tension. But it's a very important point, so I'll hold that thought, and let me move through some examples. Maybe it comes back up, let me share this. Um, so this is classic statement, you may have come across, right? And this is sort of what I try to subscribe to from, from what I just said, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast, operational excellence for lunch, and everything else for dinner. It's famously said, to, uh, said by uh, Mark Fields, XCO Ford, and then was popularized by this management guru, Peter Drucker. And I, I think that's really true, right? So if as a leader, we forget that everything starts with culture, we're not going to succeed. Um, a more radical way of looking at it, and this is, you know, this is what could happen to your company if you do not pay attention to culture, right? Then culture becomes this untamable beast. And oftentimes you see in most popular literature, culture is sort of seen as something negative, right? A constraint that sits in the way, right? I cannot get people to do things because we have this culture, right? It doesn't have to be that way, right? If we're more proactive and we take responsibility and ownership and recognize our roles, right? I really like this quote, at Shine, another management guru. He wrote, one could argue that the only real thing of importance that leaders do is to create and manage the culture. If you don't recognize this, then the culture will, will shape itself and will manage you. That's the implication. This is not to say that, you know, when you have an important strategic meeting, or when you have a strategic meeting, it's not important, right? For me, it's to say that that is also a way in which you're shaping the culture, right? Everything you do, the higher up you are in the organization, has an influence on the culture. And that's for me is inside one. It is so important. So I want you to reflect on that. Yeah. Can it be when culture leads and manages you, it's actually better for you yeah. sometimes? So can it be when culture actually is is let go free let go free yeah and, and then it, it leads you to a better place is there's how do you look at it i like the way you think is it possible to make it slightly more concrete so what would, what would that entail in yeah so when you're not so when you're not uh, trying to micromanage to keep the culture the same and then you trust in the people or, or you trust in the collective brain power that you have yeah. i don't know how to call that and then maybe at that certain time, if you just let that go to go its own way, maybe it leads you to a better place than option A is when you are completely defending. Yeah, it, uh, I agree, right? And and you know, again, there's multiple levels to where we talk about culture, but I could even rephrase that and say what you want to do as a leader is is uh, make sure that the culture is there, um, so that people are empowered to naturally display the right behavior, right? So that's easy. Right? Then I don't have to have a hierarchical structure and, and a lot of authority necessarily. Right? Taking it one step further is indeed, how do you make sure that the right culture is there? You have to display the same kind of attitude, right? If you're then trying to put the culture in place in an authoritarian hierarchical manner, but you're sending the wrong signal. Right? So I think that's a very important observation. And that becomes very difficult, right? Then right away, it's like something that is a bit beyond your control. It's something that has to be co-created. And again, it's this thousand things a thousand times. It's all the little things that are starting to matter rather than your grand design, right? And we'll get to that. A lot of companies have this, right? They drop their purpose, they drop their values, they maybe write a story around it and then throw it over the fence. Uh, people get trainings in it, but you know, they don't land, right? They don't mean anything because they weren't necessarily created. So, so how you go about that process is very important. No? Yeah. Right. Good. So still basic insights. What I want to talk to now to make it a bit more concrete, 
And then I also like you at your tables to think about these and maybe you have concrete examples because that would help us is what can go wrong when we forget about the power of culture, right? There's two types of cultural failures that you want to avoid. First one is uh, cultural inertia. And I'm gonna um, explain this, this one through what I call the banana problem, right? Culture inertia is this resistance to change, right? That's what inertia means. And there's this story, classic story, some of you may have heard this, of an experiment that was done in the 50s. And the experiment went like this. There was a cage, in the cage was a ladder. Top of the ladder was, uh, were bananas. And they put a monkey in this cage, but unbeknownst to the monkey, there was also a water cannon. At any time, someone would reach the top flight of the stairs, would spray the entire cage. As we expect, what would happen, the monkey would try to go for the bananas and would get a punishment, right? <laughs> Tried two, three times, then gave up. Now the scientists put in a new monkey that hadn't seen any of this. What do you think was, would happen? He would go up the ladder. Yeah, and then? Be pulled down by the rest because they were afraid of the punishment. Exactly, right? So the second monkey comes in, tries, first monkey aggressively stops. Stops this new monkey, right? We're not going to have this punishment again. So they repeat this, right? They had a third monkey, they had a fourth monkey. Every time the group of pre-existing monkeys gets more powerful and larger, right? And stronger in preventing the newcomer from going for the bananas. No, I think they actually interchange them, right? Now, now, now something interesting okay. happens. <laughs> They take the first monkey out, you know the story, <laughs> and they put another new monkey in, right? Now, what's interesting is that none of the monkeys have actually experienced a negative event, yet they still see the same behavior, right? None of the monkeys are going for the banana. They turn off the water cannon, no change, right? If you had somehow been able to talk to them and ask them, why are you not going for the bananas? They would have potentially said, I don't know, that's just the way we do things around here. This is, you know, a great example of what, how organization can work sometimes, right? And this is what makes organization culturally inert, right? A negative event in the past leaves an imprint inside the organization, right? And this is powerfully um, preserved, reproduced, right, by, by incumbents. So that a newcomer trying to break through it faces a very strong opposing force. And even though in the past his behavior was right because it was avoiding risks, right? Today it may not be. So you can really easily apply this scenario to sort of risk behavior, right? When you get risk aversion inside your organization, but you can take the metaphor a little bit more broadly, right? It could be any kind of cultural behavior that just persists because that was imprinted on the organization at the time when it makes sense, but today it might not. So that's one problem to keep in mind. Um, I've summarized it here. Right? It's this idea that over time, organizations become resistant to change. This idea that we become attached to the way we do things around here. And we have this cross-generational reinforcement. The banana then, for me, symbolizes this opportunity for improvement, right? If we recognize this and try and break through it. Right? Think about an example. Some of you may have an example like this inside your organization, and we can talk about that. Before we do that, I want to briefly talk about the reverse. It can happen. The reverse would be a problem of cultural drift. I'm going to substantiate that with a story that I'm ultimately going to center around that I've called the O-ring problem. And this is actually a classic story um, of the Challenger disaster, um, which was a, a NASA mission that went terribly wrong. You know about this? What happened? It doesn't matter. What, what roughly do you remember? Yeah, I think there was they they really want to to um, have that uh, record. The, yeah. They kind of missed quality signs, kind of thing, and then it went wrong. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's the essence of the story. You would went wrong, but they didn't say anything. Yeah. There's a little nuance there, but that's that's indeed part of the story. Um, so what happened? To NASA was a very successful organization at the time, came up with a number of very successful missions, the Apollo missions, and then it started to set goals for itself. So, okay, we want to make space travel more ubiquitous. That's what SpaceX is trying to do now, many decades later. It took us a long time to recover from this kind of uh, disaster. But NASA started to put more management culture in place, right? stricter performance targets, right? We needed to have this many launched a year, 
and we have these kinds of cost objectives. And um, in principle, that looked to go, be going okay, right? So even with the challenger, they did the usual procedures, the usual testing, right? And everything seemed fine on paper, right? The rockets didn't fail in any of the tests. Yet there were signals. There were little signals that ultimately, with hindsight, is easy to say, that indicated that certain parts didn't respond as well under extreme circumstances. Right? And in this case, it was the O-ring ultimately, very simple, silly seal that failed under extreme temperatures of the day of the launch, which were not simulated during the tests. Right? And that caused the engine to, to combine with the fuels in a way that led to the explosion. Right? And there was a commission put in place and the research that was done by Diane Fogan, one of my favorite authors, right, that said this is, was all about culture. The safety culture of NASA was ultimately eroded during this time of increasing performance pressure because no one was protecting them. Um, so, the true disaster. Um, so, if you summarize that and try and make that a, an example of what can happen in any organization, right, we can say that when we are confronted with performance pressures, any of our unique cultural elements, sort of ensure our longer term value, right? They can become at risk, right? If we do not have custodians, if we do not have people protecting that, right? We may lose something and this can have disastrous consequences, right? So for me, then the O-ring stands for these aspects that are really important, right? That can erode and, uh, and prevent you from a disaster if you do, if you do, if you do keep them. Um, I, you know, there's many examples that we can fit in either of these boxes, but it would be very interesting to hear at your tables um, if you can think of a specific problem. Uh, maybe we should even do it in smaller groups. So let's make groups of three or two. Right, so you hear half of a table. Um, try and briefly uh, share an example that you can think of that fits in one of these. Okay. And then when you've agreed, oh, this is a really good one, this is a really interesting one. Um, try and think of what kind of actions you think you should take to reverse, right, or improve culture in this space. So to summarize that on a slide, this is what we're going to try and do. Um, in terms of an assigned problem, you can pick one for a small group, pick a problem, find an example in your own organization, could be a well-known organization alternatively. And then think about how would you go about fixing this culture. And ideally, I want just one, one or two things that are really concrete. Don't give me a general approach, but what do you think you can do concretely to improve? Is that a good exercise? All right. Let's take 10 minutes to do that. Half of half each table. Right. Good discussion from all the tables listening in. Right. And it very good. Breaks so um, breaks. Very briefly pulling out a few examples from the room. Not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Can, can I start here? What kind of yeah. problem did you maybe setting the scene and uh, we'll discuss the I like I like the team dynamic. That's good. Yeah. So I just uh, actually started uh, um uh, when I was at Intel basically, I think when we got the new CEO. Um, and once the CEO took over, things started going well. Things every you know on the KPIs, everything looks green and everything. And then after about six months of things looking green, uh, all of a sudden an incident happened. I don't remember, uh, remember exactly, but then there's a post mortem happened, and they found out that at each level of the organization, everyone is aware, but only the CEO was not aware. So the bad news exists in the organization, but not not at the top level. Right. And there was an email sending out across the team that, hey, we know this, we know this happened. And then, um, yeah, that was the background. Was right. Great. right. So bad news was not shared, was, was kept secret or private. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what is that? That's a banana. What kind of problem is that? Oh, it's O-ring. Mm -hmm. O-ring, right? Yeah, it's drifting, actually. Because you assume that it wasn't happening in the past, and now all of a sudden we are going into culture where we're not sharing, right? And we're protecting or something. Yeah, I would agree. And how do we fix this? So one of the reasons for the problem was the, the, the new CEO itself. So and how he operates, uh, there was probably a cultural fear. 
uh, so nobody wants to lay out that there were problems. Okay. So then it's a uh, part of the solution is uh, is leading by example. So uh, he had to bring if there was bad news himself. So he could show it's good to 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 bring a bad news and to maybe to formalize it more within the MT. Maybe say yeah. okay for every big decision. Uh, we need a devil's advocate perspective. Nice. So then you have also formalized this. That's good. All right. So there's actually two actions, right? One is uh, as a leader, as a CEO, share those stories, those failure stories, for instance, right? And the other one is a, a formal structure implementation, right? It's sort of a, a rep team, right? That's just there to criticize and challenge so that more easily, right, the, the, the more negative aspects come on the table. Yeah, two two very good uh, decisions, I think. Yeah. What about you? So, yeah. So uh, when I got into my company uh, for the first weeks, uh, one of the employees asked me to hold the drill because uh, he had to drill a hole into a piece of metal. And he was you were not you were not an engineer. You were not in the construction role. Oh, okay. But uh, he was afraid that uh, at the end of the plate, the uh, drill would kick back and break his wrist. Oh. So he told me to hold the drill. Really strong, and then I asked him, "Should we do this?" And then he said, "Yeah, well, uh, we need to get a hole in this plate because uh, we need to deliver this machine on time." Right. So I instantly found out we had a safety culture problem, yeah. um, and then I reported that back. I made sure that uh, the employees were able to lay down their work when they didn't feel safe, but this guy felt safe doing this. And then I also implemented. Uh, we also implemented management walks, so we got the management into the factory to assess the safety in the factory so that they understood what their uh, decisions and goals right. how they affected in, in, yeah in, in the in the in the machinery nice. so we were now one and a half years down the road and work is being stopped more often now we're not there yet but at least we get a lot of uh, registrations and the management sees the problem so they're a little bit less forcing to get kpis uh, and looking more after safety and health of the end of the employees wow. it also be the KPI. It, yeah, but it's really hard. Uh, to it's difficult to quantify. I think I think it do be the strong zone in oil gas and yeah. it's, it's about for uh, sure uh, yeah. the, the amount of injuries. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a proxy, right? Oh, no, but then this is also so. I would, let me let me elaborate yeah. one thing on this. So we always have this discussion. I mean, if you're in oil gas or I was a metal before, they say the LTI should be zero, right? Okay. So we shouldn't have any LTIs. But that in itself gives a strange culture because people yeah. will not report yeah. because the metric has to be at zero. So you should allow for some LTIs and you should yeah. just tell people yeah. we live in an inherent danger situation. Yeah. One pe one of you will, yeah. and then you have a better safety culture than saying it should be zero. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it, right? It's it's how you use those KPIs and what you do with them is again, is important for how the culture uh, thrives or not. Uh, from this side, any exams that we're eager to share? I'm not, I unfortunately not, cannot go through all of them, but someone's like, yeah, this is a, this is a good one that I can add to this. Must be one. Otherwise, I'll point. Yeah, you want to go? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess I was, I, I was actually uh, still thinking whether it was, whether I, I will get the background uh, first. Um, at Samsung, um, they, have a, they, they used to have a really hard time. Uh, protecting their core values uh, in their offices worldwide. Uh, for instance, uh, my dad used to work for Samsung for yeah. a bit of time. Um, and whenever, uh, whenever he tried to make an effort of understanding their core value and the culture better, he was actually uh, told not to. For instance, he wanted to uh, learn how to speak Korean and he was told not to because they, yeah, they, 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 they had fear that he could right. uh, change the, their, 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 their culture. Of, uh, he was kept out. To some extent, maybe. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think that resulted in uh, that there was too big of a distance uh, between uh, Samsung's core values uh, and the actual employees um, yeah, leading into declining results quarter after quarter, uh, all the way onto like a really uh, radical transformation, uh, exiting many uh, talent uh, from the organization to other companies. Yeah. Uh, and I think that all comes from a fear of trying to protect your core values uh, without adapting to local uh, areas where you also operate. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. And what? How, how do you go about changing that? Yeah, that's actually uh, what, we done, uh, what we did not get an answer to yet. Because um, I think it's, 
yeah, I think it's hard uh, because it's also because it's also really subjective. Because uh, what, what what works here in, in the Netherlands uh, probably does not work uh, right away in the U.S. or uh, in Africa, right? Somewhere else in the world, yeah. Uh, especially not in Asia, probably. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the, the, the find a balance between protecting your core values uh, and uh, having a consistent uh, global company culture, and uh, have a, having a sense of collective uh, ownership between uh, amongst all employees. Yeah. I think there's a yeah. I think that, that, that that's the biggest dilemma uh, yeah. something has faced then. Interesting. Any ideas, observations on this case? Because I think it's really an interesting one. I used to actually work uh, for some sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. like a dual culture. So there was uh, yeah. Korean, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, sometimes the news would already travel from HQ to all the Korean employees and the news would be a week later to the Dutch people, for example, mm -hmm. or vice versa. So it's, uh, we work yeah, I think like if there's a dual culture, that might ultimately be yeah. yeah, there we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> Recognize this? Yes. I, yeah, because like, uh, I, I come from like a, a Thailand, but I also have the French culture yeah. from Korean as well. But from my perspective, I still feel like there is a not really 100% Korean culture in work environment. I still feel that the company here also adjusts to it, uh, a yeah. Korean culture. It does, yeah. totally, right. Yeah. yeah, so I, I want to add something, but make it a little bit broader. I yeah. think it's not specific to Samsung. Yeah. I think most companies are managed by all academic people, and they're usually um, people with MBAs. So I think if you look at the top of a company, it rarely yeah. re resembles what the company is yeah. about. Mm -hmm. So I think, and it's, it's the same with politics. It's it's yeah. a metric to our society that yeah. uh, some that are more privileged than others determine how the culture on top level is. Yeah. And it's really hard for some people to get there. I mean, we're on the right side of things, but a lot of people are on the wrong side of things. Right. There's a lot to this, right? And there's so many things that 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 relate to this, right? So why do we often see that companies have purposes and values that are ultimately window dressing because that's not how they're felt on the shop floor? Part of it is this, because we, we miss that connection. Uh, there's other things as well, right? And one one thing that I ultimately want to arrive at is that, for me, this is not a grand design exercise, right? Uh, you cannot think about uh, changing your core values and then and then changing the company, right? It's again, it's a thousand things a thousand times. So what you need to do is define a cultural problem, right? And then think about okay, what is it in you know the essence of an organization, right? That is an issue that we want to want to improve on right where is the opportunity for improvement and, and so that's that's one right make it make it pragmatic <laughs> in that sense rather than doing grand 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 design the second one is uh, oh, right away think about the balance right it's right away it's about unintended potential unintended consequences that you want to account right you can never optimize just on safety culture alone right it's always in balance with something else right so those are two starting points right and, and then it's about using a way of thinking and approach, and ultimately I'm gonna put this in a framework, right? That allows us to make progress. And it's never done. It is never done, right? Your safety culture can always be improved and it always requires attention. Who, who here is, has responsibility for, for culture actually in your organization? You do, I guess, yeah. That's it? Yeah. In what way? I, I own a company. You own a company. So uh, and you set some examples. I, I would challenge you and I would say I would have liked to have seen all the hands. Yes, I, I thought that, that would have been the default answer. But then if I if I said, do I really do something about it? Um, I don't try to change the whole culture of the company. I changed my 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 team's sure. culture. Yeah. I, I try to make it different, my own team. But yeah. uh, you know, if some other team is doing something different, then I'm not going to go challenge that. Sure. But you still have an effect by not doing that. Yeah, true. Right. I recognize right. that. Effect. So it's important. Oh, it's always important to recognize, no matter where you are in the organization, um, there there is always this responsibility, right? There's always this custodianship. I'm using that term of of of, of aspects of the organization that are important. And if and if we only outsource that to the CEO <laughs> or someone in a specific team, then it's not gonna not gonna fly, right? And that's the challenging part, making everybody 
recognize that, but also, you know, um, giving people, uh, empowering people to take on that role, right? And um, that's, that's our one. You see a difference in being responsible and accountable for the culture? Yeah. Can you, can you make it more specific? What do you mean by that? Uh, no, well, I, I kind of feel responsible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Like if of course. Happen, if KPIs don't change towards to be more sustainable, yeah. that's all my CEO yeah. or the person that. Absolutely. So there's a difference, I think. I agree. Right. And increasingly, we see that as well. So, for instance, in financial services, which I've actually done a lot of programs in, large banks that had massive cultural problems, you now see that going into the regulation, right, where a senior manager is directly responsible for what happens in their line of reporting, right? Even if, you know, they didn't give a direct order or something, but just because a culture was created and they were not managing on this and there was misconduct, now the, the senior manager is liable. It's really clearly regulated. So I clearly, I would say that makes sense, right? I also would like to know, you know like uh, how can I, as like uh, not in the management position, able to, or about to you know, like drive the change of the culture within the company. Yeah, uh, we can have a whole session on this, right? Uh, but there's 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 just two two small things, right? One is again that thing about a thousand things a thousand times, right? So all the little things matter, right? Here um, we have a colleague at Mandeville, um, uh, Eva Rhodes, who is our director of positive change. Some of you may have met her. She always tells this story about uh, how we transform uh, our organization or our world to realize our SDG objectives, right? And she tells the story of the hummingbird, right? And there's a fire somewhere in a forest and, no, and all the animals are flooding. And then there's a hummingbird that comes and brings one drop of water every time. And the other animals are asking, why, you know, why are you doing this? Like, it's, it's never going to help. So, well, you know, we've got to start somewhere, right? And if we all do a drop, you know, we make it. She always tells a story, but the culture, it can be like that. Right? The other one, the more important one, the harder one, <laughs> is actually finding like-minded others, right? There's always an opportunity to, to generate something inside an organization that you connect with others uh, in, in similar roles and think similar and, and raise. And then hopefully, hopefully your company has a culture where you can speak up. Yeah. Right? That's a challenging thing. If you have a company that doesn't have a speak up culture and yeah, but then right. you get this attention. Yeah, you get these, uh, what do you call them, uh, whistleblower uh, rules yeah. regulations in part, which is basically telling them yeah. you're allowed to speak up, which is completely opposite to what you really want. Yes. Yeah. I even would go so far as saying that the term whistleblower is already problematic. Yeah. So if you have a whistleblower policy in your organization, I already sort of think about you know, that's a cultural signal. What kind of signal does it give? I don't want to really be called a whistleblower. Yes. Right? So, so Johnson & Johnson is famous for in, de-institutionalizing this already a long time ago. And they, they have policies that do this, but they don't talk about whistleblowing. Right? It's just not a thing. Anyway, what I'd like to, I like your thinking, by the way. Right? So we had really good thinking on sort of more symbolic acts that you needed to do, but then also more formal structural acts that had to go along with it for actually it to, 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 to make sense. Right? So this is the way... I, I like to think about it. Again, this is for me not a checkbox exercise. It's not a mechanical structure. It's just something that I reflect on and see what are the things that potentially can go wrong or what are we potentially missing in how we're trying to align on culture. Right? It starts with something in the middle that you want to try and embed or improve. And again, this shouldn't be grand design, but it could be you know we want to improve our safety culture. right? And we define that in a particular way, which is hard, but we need to try and express that in some way. Then the next step is, what are all the places of the organization, right, where we touch that or where we can uh, observe that, elements of it, or where we can influence that, right? And in principle, that's the entire organization. And here you can see a separation between the more sort of informal sides, right? And this is where most cultural initiatives go, but then they tend to end. So we tell stories around what we want and need, these grand visions. We may even have symbols. Symbols can be a very broad category, but you know, we can get safety awards for someone that uh, held up the practices in a really good way uh, or, or, or other things. I worked for a long time, I worked for the Barclays Bank. We had a large program there and they started to define values. And one of the things they did was symbolize those values by putting really big statues 
in the, 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 the hallway when you enter their, 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 their headquarters. Um, but there was an acronym for their values. So the values were right in your face as a piece of art. Right? This is what a lot of companies do, right? Symbolizing them so people can relate to these stories, see them. The harder part is checking all the other aspects of the organization, right? Because if you tell that story, but then right away on another side of the organization, you see a contradiction, people say, you know, that story, I don't believe it, right? And this is where things go wrong. Not necessarily because of bad intention, just because this is really hard. Again, it's a thousand things a thousand times, right? I like Jerry Johnson's way of classifying. Again, you can classify it in different ways, but he says what you also need to pay attention to is the implicit power structures in the organization, right? So it could be about the dynamic you just described, right? beyond just roles, who, what kind of person really has the power. Formal organizational structures, right? So organizations often, you see silos emerging, uh, the banks, you see the tension between the business and compliance, right? That does something to the culture. Uh, rituals and routines, very powerful. I think all of you touched a little bit on that. And for instance, meetings, how do we do meetings? They happen all the time, right? Such a powerful touch point to see how the culture is functioning, but also an opportunity for improvement, right? Little things. And then the, the most difficult one probably is our, what Jerry Johnson describes as the control systems. And there is anything um, to do with how we incentivize or punish particular types of behavior in the organization, right? Could be about our cost systems, but a really important one is how we remunerate people, right? So who gets uh, awarded what and why and when? Who gets promoted? Who gets hired? Why and when? These are very powerful signals what the company values, right? And again, in financial services, the work we've done there, I've seen it done a really good job on this side, but then at the end of the day, if you see who gets the bonus, Right? That is ultimately the strongest cultural signal. Right? And that has taken them a very long time and they're still not there. Right? So Barclays is now, you don't even see the values actually appear on the website. I'm not sure what happened, uh, but this is a, a place where companies struggle. Right? So again, that takes responsibility for everybody and it needs to be consistent. Also, yeah, if you say we wanna improve safety culture, you need to try and consider all these things. And that's what I liked about the examples that you were thinking in that way already. You know, you can think about what you want to change and add, but it's similarly important to express what you want to maintain, right? Especially when we talk about the balancing act, um, we talk about a young company, right? What are the things that we actually want to make sure we protect and where can we embed that and protect that question? I have a question. Uh, maybe other people also know the answer uh, on it. But, um, uh, I like I, it's practical because yeah. um, if you think about like a big organization, uh, a lot of people already mentioned that like the CEO has like has a big influence on how the culture would be. Um, but as an owner, you have like a lot of different things you have to manage, right? And if you only talk about like culture, which is very important, but as you can mention, it's also very a thing which you can spend a lot of time on. Yeah. Um, like like you can you can like spend whole your day to like influence your culture and think about it, but you have to also do your own work. Yeah. So like, how would you, yeah. How would I like that. And how do you organize this? Oh, we have, we have an answer, right? That's, that's the easiest crowd. So yeah, the answer so comes from the crowd. <laughs> so to start with, I don't think the CEO has any influence over the culture. So I think it happens when he's making up plans. So I think there's, and also, so I manage around roughly 100 people. And I think there's three or four guys that I manage that are the influential leaders that hype up the rest of the, company to get into some sort of cultural mode and it's not that if i tell them to go left everybody goes left it's these four people that are usually in key positions that are basically shaping the culture and are getting everybody somewhere so it's it's i think it's really hard for a ceo to actually change the culture uh, he can only fire people and then try to get new people in but yes it, it, it's the people who fall but yeah, that is true but there's still something to this question that we also need to answer so you as a leader has a lot of influence on, on your people. And I think it's mm -hmm. 80 percent that is copy behavior, something like that. Mm. But that's not only your positive behavior, but also your negative mm. behavior. So it's really important that you as a leader and the people underneath you and that the, the good behavior will be copied. Yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. also important. It's yeah. By example. There's still one one other element that I will answer, but, but I would uh, like the thoughts here. Uh, I was going to say that. As a leader, in everything you do, you 
you said you said the culture so you say how do i combine the cultural effort with my own work but when you do your own work all the decisions you make also influence the culture yeah. so True, but I still, there's still a pragmatic problem, right? So you own a company, right? Uh, you cannot constantly be aware of what is happening throughout the organization if it's consistent with what you hope the culture is, right? Um, what I've seen, for instance, again, in these financial service organizations that thought, thought really hard about this and tried to change things, they've improved significantly, a lot of issues still in place. But for instance, an organization like Barclays has set up uh, what was initially a, 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 a compliance department. Right? And this was initially about legal compliance, regulatory compliance. Over time, that really became about culture. Everything became reputation and people risk. So what did they do over time? They saw themselves increasingly as the custodians of, of culture, what is, you know, right, ethical culture. And they got a seat at Exco uh, at the table where strategy is made. Right? And they, in some ways, they became the red team, the challenge team. Right? So CEO is sitting down, making strategy, there's targets. Uh, the chief compliance officer says, yeah, that's great, but I worry about the signal in this sense to our culture and what impact that may have on how people are going to observe our values, right? So that's one structure that you can have, right? Yes, you're responsible. You cannot observe everything, but can you, everybody has a responsibility, but can we specifically also design a function or a role that goes a step further, right? And checks and challenges in, in that position. Good question, because how do we organize this is really important. Um, we have time, I think, for um, what I think is a nice example of best practices. Again, no company is perfect. We can challenge here as well. But one company that I've taken some inspiration from and I've worked with quite a bit also uh, in my previous employer when I spent time in Cambridge, um, and that company is Airbnb. Um, so this is, you know, we know startup Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is not particularly known for breeding companies that have a really healthy culture. Uh, there's a lot of companies that have problems in that space, I would say. Uh, but Airbnb seems to be an exception. Um, I've interacted quite a bit with their um, their head of public policy for uh, for EMEA. Um, so I've seen this also from the inside a bit. Um, but there was a really interesting period. So this is around 2014 uh, when Airbnb was growing. They were really scaling up. They had their last round of investments. And they had Peter Thiel, top investor, that had just agreed to new terms. And they, he was now coming for a visit, really follow up and check what are the plans, what are you going to do with my money? And they had prepared this, you know, big presentation as you do, right? A lot of numbers, the KPIs, everything was there, right? They were not even on slide one. And Peter Thiel said, you know what? I don't need this. I'll stop you right there. I don't need to see this. It's all fine, right? I just have one message for you. And it's this. Don't F up the culture. That is really my main concern. I see you have something magical here. You're doing something really unique. I've seen too many times that companies in your position scaling up, numbers looking great, but they forgot about the culture. They effed it up, and then I lost my investments. So I want you to think right now how we can maintain this. So they started thinking about this. Um, and I'm going to, for sake of time, I thought maybe we do an exercise on this, but I think you've, you've covered. Will you share this presentation? Yeah, I will. I will. I'll make sure it somehow gets to you. Um, the first thing he did was share this story. Share this story with all employees of Airbnb. Right? So he wrote a memo. You can still find it. It's on the side of Medium, 2014. A letter to employees. A long letter. It says a lot of great things. One thing I'll pick out here. He said, uh, the thing that will endure for 100 years, the way it has for most 100-year companies, is the culture. The culture is what creates the foundation for all future in innovation. If you break the culture, you break the machine that creates your products. We build culture by upholding our values in everything we do. Culture is a thousand things a thousand times. Already signaling that this is coming come back. It's living the core values when you hire, when you write an email, when you're working on a project, when you're walking down the hall. We have the power by living the values to build the culture. We also have the power by breaking the values to F up the culture. Each one of us has this opportunity, this burden. Powerful, right? The CEO is sharing this, that everybody has a responsibility and needs to contribute. Um, what do you think the essence of Airbnb is? Or how do you think they would define that? I want to say, what, what is their culture about? Community. Community, trust. 
we can uh, be entrepreneurial because he doesn't say what you need to do. So it's up to everyone to make up their own mind. In a little bit, yeah, that's part of it. Hmm? Keep innovation, like continue yeah. innovation. It is closer to community and trust. They actually, and this is their, their, their notion that they use is belonging. Their culture is all about belonging. And it defines how they see their organization in the world. They want to create a world in which everybody belongs. You can challenge what their business model does on that spot, but the, the principle is that we're providing people with accommodation so they can travel somewhere and they can feel that they actually belong there, right? that you're not a sort of, sort of inauthentic, fake, touristy part of it. No, you're in a real place. Right? But more importantly, it's about their internal organization principles as well. Right? We want to create a culture in which everybody feels that they belong truly in the organization. Not like a straitjacket, right? It is, it, is, it is a diversity kind of implication. Right? Everybody needs to feel that they can belong here. What Airbnb has, that I think, makes them really remarkable. It's, as far as I know, the only Silicon Valley startup of this size that's actually profitable. It's, if you look at the company like Uber, they still are not generating a profit. Right? It took Amazon probably 30 years, I think, to really become profitable. Globally, in the US in any case, Airbnb is extremely profitable. Partially it's in the serendipitous business model thing where they hold a lot of money for a long time, so they send me bank. But it also has something to do with, with, with how they organize. The people they have there go to such great lengths to perform their role. They are all more holistic, more knowledgeable about all aspects of the product. Right? So they have so many issues hitting them, regulation, right? local regulation, and Mozambique, right? How their platform uh, functions in Hebrew. There's so many things, a financial regulation. I always talk to the, 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 um, the pub, head of public policy, said, I don't understand how, how you can try it because I see so many problems with your model and somehow you make it work. And partly that has to do with how they invest in the people and that has something to do with how they define culture. Now, they grow. They grow, they have this culture of belonging and they grow and, you know, they seem to lose some of this magic. People come in that, you know, don't really, they come from finance, they do things differently. <laughs> um, people feel that they're not really heard anymore. There's strategic decisions, they don't really understand them, right? They're, lo they're losing it. Losing it. it was there when the company was small, they all understood it. There was nice memos for the CEO, right? But now they're becoming more corporate and it's gone. They address this, they address this. Some ideas, what do you think? What would you do? Where would you look? I think one of the issues with these things is that as an employee of this company, you're frustrated with the, with the decisions. Yep. You have a choice of either being frustrated and perhaps leaving the company or becoming apath you know, have, yeah. you know, uh, apathy, let's say. Yep. I'm not sure how you would say it. Yeah. Um, so apathy is very dangerous for Airbnb because of the complexity. Yes. People say it's not my job, so I don't care. Yeah. Being frustrated, it's also not well, not a sustainable, a safe state of mind. This is precisely what was happening. So, right. So how how can you refer that? Maybe promote more internally that the, the, the promotions need to go more to people from inside the company okay. than hiring. Experts. Yeah. So right, look at our hiring. Right, look at our hiring processes. Who do we bring in and why? And how do we promote people? Yeah. So Very good. what you could also do is have your employees hire new employees, right? Interesting. How would that work? Yeah, because I think if, instead of say a manager that actually needs to fill a position, yeah. you're creating or the yeah, colleagues, colleagues to hire the new guy and then to see uh, if he fits the team or not or the culture. This is precisely what they did. One of the things they did on this front, right? So before they had an idea that company values and the founders were there with every initial hire, right? And they continued that for a long time, probably longer than they should, right? But at some point, it's like giving you, we cannot possibly keep doing it. Then they thought like, why are we actually there? Well, it's to check if someone fits our idea of, of this, this idea of belonging, right? Again, not as a straitjacket, precisely to prevent sort of, um, um, what, do you, what do you call like, biases, right? That you need someone quickly, you hire something that resembles you without checking further, for instance, right? So they created a committee, it's an Airbnb, I think it's called the Core Values Committee. I find the name always a bit, I don't know, 
Right? But the principle is great, right? So it's people that do not have technically anything on the line for a hire, but they're simply there to check a challenge. Hmm, I'm not sure if this person really fits with Airbnb. Can they, would they really uphold these values? Right? They can ask critical questions. Right? Um, so this, this is one, one little thing. That, another thing they do and what they're known for is they change the way they structured meetings. Um, so they said from now on in every meeting, this is a place where people can be heard and feel included. And this is also a place where oftentimes we see naturally biases, right? Particularly dominant, uh, people with dominant traits in an organization or dominant positions, right? Can also dominate the way a meeting runs, right? So how can you reverse it? How can you create inclusion and belonging there? And they had a quite a, a silly, but very, very, um, powerful intervention. And it was at the end of a meeting, three things need to be aired from now on. And this is true. The, one, the first thing that needs to be aired is vomit. Vomit symbolized complaints. Anything you want to complain about, now is your time. Right? So the meeting is sort of the technical part is over. Okay. Is there any vomit? Let's air it. It's fine. We can air it now. It's safe. The second one they did was airing dead fish. Just through they use these terms. Uh, and dead fish stood for uh, anything that happened in the past that you know was over, it didn't really matter, but it somehow still you know shaped your attitude or mood about, towards something. But let's have it, let's let's air it, let's express them, let's let's recognize them. And the third one, elephants. Right, this is the, the, the obvious one, right? Is there something that everybody's thinking but no one is saying? All these three things had to be aired uh, in every meeting. It worked really well in Airbnb. It worked also really well because you know it was not the only thing they did, right? It was their broader initiative to actually make people feel comfortable doing that. There's a question here as well. I love the intervention part. I think it's also like how do you then is their side this channel so then the vomit elephant and death. Then how do you create this trust and safety? So then they they're comfortable. I think that is the key. Then could you share some examples that they do that really creates this safety culture? Yeah, indeed, who speaks up for the elephant? Indeed. Well, it, you know, it, again, it's a thousand things a thousand times, right? If you do this in isolation, it's not going to work, right? If we have a, a problem with speaking up, and now all of a sudden we bring this in, I was teaching to a large. A law firm that has an issue here last week, and I talked about this, and it's like, well, you should you should probably do other things as well, right? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things, right? One is the fact that the CEO is writing this, right, and reinforcing this from the top. Um, the other thing that they that they did, which can potentially go in this space, is thinking about how do you navigate through crises, and specifically how do you um, lay off people when times are tough. How do you let go of people? It's a powerful example of Airbnb as well. Um, they recognize very quickly that it's specifically during times of crisis that you can shape or break your culture, right? If all these nice things are out of the window, as soon as um, the times are tough, then they not, not, don't mean anything. Right? So what they did during the COVID crisis, when out of a sudden their whole business model was broken, they had to lay off a lot of people, they went to extreme lengths to understand uh, who should go and who should stay. And then they didn't only spend a lot of time explaining to the people that had to leave why ultimately they had to leave and they got a really nice package that went beyond legal requirements. No, no, they paid really specific attention to the people that stayed. Right? So that everybody that stayed understood why they were staying. And that was really important because that was the most the, the biggest worry, right? You lay off people and the signal could be, oh, I could be next, right? That creates, that is another foundation of safety, right? You start to worry. Right? So again, a thousand things a thousand times, Airbnb being particularly powerful during, during crisis. And so he wrote also again, a public memo to the entire organization. The crisis brings you clarity about what's truly important. The world needs human connection now more than ever. And I know Airbnb will rise to the occasion our mission is not merely about travel. What we are about is belonging. And at the center of belonging is love. And even further. 
it's nice. I like this. I don't see every company doing this. But at the end of the day, you know, if a CEO says that and means that and lives that, that's powerful, right? So that goes a long way. Good. Um, started to bring us to the end. Airbnb did quite well after this, actually. Um, so during COVID, they were able to pivot exceptionally quickly to alternative business models in spite of all this turbulence. And so you may have seen this. They went through Go Near campaign. They had uh, online experiences that people could do. Not, you know, brain-blowing innovations, but the way they were able to do this really quickly and effectively showed something about the resiliency of the organizational culture. And they actually IPO towards the end of the um, pandemic. And this is live on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on television. And Brian Chesky, here's uh, the, the opening price that was almost double the initial listing. And you literally see his, his eyebrows go from <laughs> no. Right? So they did really successful. They're still doing quite successful, but this is a new, new territory, right? They're scaling, they're now subject to public pressure. So the question is, is their culture resilient enough? I don't know yet, we'll have to find out, right? Um, so that's it. Um, this is what I wanted to share with you. I wanted to share with you ultimately this framework that helped me to think about this. I wanted to share with you the bigger, the bigger message, right? That everything is culture, right? It's a thousand things a thousand times. And hopefully I've given you some ideas of how, depending on where you are in your organization, what position you're in, uh, continue to be a force for positive change when it comes to your organizational culture. What I will do is share the slides towards the end of the deck. I knew we were going to get this. It's also a process model. Um, so if you really want to start doing something, you can consider this process model of sort of roughly steps that you could take towards shaping culture in the process. Right? That's it. Um, thanks very much. Um, I think we're, we're on a strict schedule.